thank you, Ms. Bailey. That was a super cool presentation. Um, up next, we have James Brockman. Mr. Brockman is from the National American Defenders of Baton and Corregidor Museum Education Research Center. He is here to talk about the Defenders of the Philippines POW's 1941-1945 collection. Hi, my name is Jim Brockman. Uh, I'm the curator of the National American Defenders of the Corregidor Museum and Education Research Center. It does the phone business card, by the way. And it is my email address. So, uh, but um, it's a uh, large collection outside of, outside, of, uh, outside of the National Archives. We have 1.5 million pages of documents. We have 30,000 photographs. We have uh, 10,000 3D objects. We have 1,700 books and manuscripts. We also have other collections, including the Adolf Hitler, Dwight D. Eisenhower, Doodle Raiders, Normandy Invasion maps, and the Fourth Infantry. We also have a Lindbergh collection, believe it or not, with a katana that was given by Amelia Earhart's family to us. So we have a wide variety of um, military artifacts and documents, but the main thrust is Botanic Corregidor. These three gentlemen here founded the museum up at the Brooklyn County Public Library in 2002. A.D. Abraham is in the center. He was on the Botan Death March. He is going to be, in, his wife's going to be interviewed uh, several weeks with the six rangers uh, when they go over in the Philippines and in, with their project next year. Eddie Jackford is from Wellsburg. And Joe Vlaughter was from McKees Rocks. These are all POWs. They all survived the war, and they all came back. A.B. Abraham's job after World War II, the war was over was to dig up the bodies on the Matan Death March. This is the original reading room, research room, as, as when it was started in 2002, uh, and it's dedicated now to uh, the collections of the, what we call the gray sets. You'll see that in a minute. These are the salad bars. I told you about the salad bars. They, do the salad. they look like the salad bars from Bonanza, but uh, they, they hold artifacts. Uh, this particular case here uh, is an older photograph, um, and they hold uh, artifacts from Eddie Jackford's collection. This is in the founder's room, and underneath there are 1,700 books relating to Bataan, Craig, or World War II. Uh, these are the gray sets. Uh, thanks to a grant from PNC Bank, we were able to preserve those 1,500 diaries and documents that we call the gray sets. Um, they came in polyurethane binders, you knew it, duct tape and uh, uh, scotch tape does the polyurethane and paper, they don't mix. It's like oil and water. So we have those all preserved. Where'd it go? Oh, here we go. Uh, the individual collections is the Rossi collection and the Carter collection. The first Quan uh, is up in the left-hand corner, which was a book or a diary they kept. Quan means gathering. And so we have 2,900 Quans. And we have individual POW diaries and documents relating to just about everything at the start of World War II. We even have a bombing order for Hiroshima and uh, signed by Paul Tippett's. This is the Founders Room. Uh, it's been uh, rededicated to the Founders. In this room we have approximately 1,700 books, like I said before, and various things relating to the story of the Tan Death March. Oh, where did I go? Here we go. We just added this room on 2015. This is the Tan Cregador Room. It's 4,500 square feet. That flag you see in the back, is an American flag, it's the last one that made it out of the Philippines in 1942 on the bonefish. It's called the High Commissioner's Flag. That's Francis C. Pirate, San Francis uh, C. I uh, 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 forgot his last name, but anyways, that's the flag. It's the only one like it in the world. So the rest of them all burned, ordered by uh, Francis P. Cyrus to burn flags before he left on the bonefish. 
We found it at the flea market down in Florida. Yeah, you never know which one walks through the door where you're going to find it. This is more pictures of the Montana Crater displays. We have, a lot of, we have several Shogu Amoras, uh, and those are battle flags that were signed by the villagers in Japan and went off to war with the, with the warrior, Japanese warrior. This particular Shogu Amora you see in there, the Red Bull, was from Iwo Jima. So we have a lot of, and we have a lot of moral flags and a lot of photographs. Like I said, we have 30,000 photographs. Individual things, personal artifacts, that uh, cigarette case was dropped by a B-29, containing that cigarette case was an American flag. And when they dropped the canisters at the end of the war, 55-gallon drums and canisters with food and clothes and stuff like that, in this particular camp here, uh, one went through the commandant's uh, office and went through his desk, but the Japanese commandant had left by that time, so he didn't get hit in the head. Um, this is uh, this room is dedicated to the heritage. This room is dedicated to the veterans of West Virginia, and this particular destroyer, uh, John Durbin from West Virginia, was on it. Sailed around the world along with along with John, uh, Captain Alexander, and so we dedicate uh, this room to veterans of West Virginia exclusively. We don't care what war it is. We don't care what period it is. As long as the veterans of West Virginia. This is our conference room with a 65 inch flat screen TV and surround sound. Yes, we can break windows and we did when we had, we, we were watching the movie and we decided to crank it up and see how good it was. And we broke it. We broke a window. <laughs> but, yeah, that was a big, 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 big challenge. But we had a spare window so we put it back in. This is our color bearing. And one of the stipulations when John Merriweather of Wellsburg and David Hubbard of Wellsburg gave us almost, uh, almost three quarters of a million dollars to add on to the building, that they put a columbarium out in the back of the river. And some of the niches are already taken. There's some folks in there right now. Matter of fact, the guy that built the building for us, Danny Hoople, is buried in the, one of the niches. He died right after the building was built, unfortunately. Didn't, didn't get to see everything we were going to do with it. So we, we had a hard time convincing the folks down here in uh, Charleston that we weren't putting a cemetery together. It's a call of 21 days is no way, you know, whatever. But for 2100 bucks, you can uh, be buried here. We already have some pre-arrangements made for folks, and we have three people that took advantage of it. Uh, and so we honor those guys. And some of them are veterans, some are not. But they want to be down by the river. And that's one of the blocks say, down by the riverside. We have a lot of photographs. We have hundreds of camp photos. This is Camp of Antoine. It's one of the worst camps in, in the history of World War II. Thousands of men died, almost on a daily basis. Hundreds died on a daily basis. And the six rangers raided it in 45, came back, and it got about 517 POWs out of it. The six rangers are now going back over in January to retrace these steps. We have the list of all the, all the ones that were disinterred there. We also have the list of the rangers that uh, raided, raided the camp. And so they're all excited that we have all this information. And they're going back to retrace this whole thing. A lot of folks that send us stuff, they retrace their family steps. They go back to the Philippines and they retrace their loved ones' steps and they send us photographs, documents, and, and, and stuff like that. This is the nurses and civilians. Not, not many people know this. There were nurses and civilians that got rounded up. Remember, he, how many of you know Frank Bockles, World War I, last World War I guy? Yeah, okay. Frank was in this camp in World War II. He was working over Cavite for uh, an air conditioning company, carrier air conditioning, and he ended up in the camp. He spent three and a half years as a POW, as a civilian, at Camp at Santo Tomas. Another um, West Virginian raided this camp and liberated all the nurses in February 1945. And so we have all this stuff too. Thousands were transported on health ships. We have a health ship collection. If you notice, the ships aren't 
ships does the same about they have a POWs on board. So unfortunately, our submarine force uh, destroyed a number of hell ships with the, with the POWs on board. The biggest one was the Oakland Roo, which is sunk in Subic Bay. Another one is the Asian Roo, which was sunk just north of there. And they lost 1,700 POWs. So, and they transported to Japan. Because Japan didn't realize how many people they had to deal with. On the death march, Thomas said, I didn't know I had 66,000 people to deal with. So they decided to split them up. They put them on health ships. They marched them up. And they told the Philippines they could go home. So the Philippines went home. They were on health ships. This is one of the best steel drawings. They spent months, weeks, days. People died on a daily basis. They threw them overboard. The stench was so bad, the only way you'd have to get fresh air was to take the slop bucket upstairs on the top deck, throw it overboard so you could breathe fresh air. Or you would cook. And you'd cook rice. But they stayed in these holes for that long, that, a long time. And they were bombed by our own troops. And they could hear the torpedoes coming, and they would yell, torpedo, torpedo. And the Japanese captain would turn the ship, a third ship sideways to the torpedo, so the torpedo wouldn't hit the boat. This is an issue on Flyer Mill. We have photographs. This is where the Jacker was, was interned. At the same time as we were torpedoing the hell ships, we were bombing POW camps. And this one was on fire. And, uh, it got, he got hit a couple of times, and Eddie Jackman had to run for his life because we were bombing them too. Once, once they were liberated, they could go out into the camp. Joe Water had a, found a camera at the pharmacy in the, outside the camp here in Moncton prison camp. And it got 13 rolls of 120 film and shot a whole bunch of pictures we have. And when the Russians came to liberate them, he took pictures of all the Russian soldiers and nurses and stuff like that, and the trains they were on. And they could go out in the camp and mingle amongst the folks. And if they had money, and they had, some had money, they could buy stuff. This is another camp. This is an interesting story. Here's this Count Davio. The Japanese got tired of us bombing the airfield outside of Davio while our period of were trying to put the road back together. So on December 6, 1944, they, they, they abandoned the camp and sent them on hell ships to Japan. If you notice on the roof, you see the sheet, bed sheets of PW. And that's what, they, that's what they did. They put the word PW or POW on the roof so we wouldn't bomb them. Sometimes the Japanese would make them lay out in the middle of the yard there when the planes come over and the bombs are driving down so they could look up and see the bombs coming down on them. This one is particularly interesting because if you look at it, they look kind of fat, don't they, for being in a prison camp? Average person lost 35% of their weight, if not more. Well, when we dropped the canisters on the camps, they had all kinds of stuff in there. They, and Harold Poole will tell you, says, when I got that canister, so they would drop these canisters on them. And some got sick because they ate too much, they ate too fast, or they didn't, their stomach didn't realize what was going on. But they were, they were basically to the point where they uh, couldn't, they had to be very careful how they ate. And you have to understand this, we have a document in the, in the archives that says MacArthur told us to send them, uh, feed them six ounces of beef every three days. He cut the rations twice. January 6, 1942, and in March 1942. So if you go and get that Big Mac, that's how much they ate every three days. And we have documentation that says they were emaciated on the death march before they even started. There's a famous picture of these guys laying down on the death march. And they, were, they died because they were already emaciated to, because they, they didn't have enough nourishment. The average person has taken 2,500 calories. They were taking less than 900 calories in a day. Well, guess what? The war's over. And there's a funny story about this. We have a collection of um, stuff from Missouri. Because a guy from, well, 
uh, Jake Churchman from Wellsburg, West Virginia, another West Virginian, was working for MacArthur the day each insurance company across the street from the moat, across the street from the Emperor's Palace. And he was a communications specialist. So he jumped on the Buchanan with MacArthur, and he, he was told to stay on the Buchanan, but he said, you know what, there's something going on over there. So I jumped, he jumped off the Buchanan, and he went on to Missouri. And he's up in the gun tubs. And he took his picture at 9.05. Okay, he took the picture 905, September 2nd, when Shigemitsu signed the document. There's a couple stories about the document. One document is covered with canvas. That's the Japanese copy. The other copy is done up in leather, made with parchment they found in the Philippines. Well, the guy, the one from the Australian contingent signed in the wrong place on the Japanese document, so they got all upset. So they had to scratch his name out, redo it, and put it back so he could sign it in the right spot. But they lost the document. They don't, they don't know where the document is. We're trying to have the, the guy. We're working with museums over in, in Japan. They're trying to find the document, but they, they can't find it. They lost their copy. Our copy's sitting down in the Naval Museum in Annapolis, Maryland. But Jay took this picture along with a whole bunch of pictures of the occupation of Japan. We have three collections for the occupation of Japan. We have the rubble photos from Hiroshima two, taken two weeks after the bomb was dropped by a guy named Woods, another guy from Wellsburg. We're a world-renowned research center. We have people coming from all over the world asking for things and looking for documents and helping them write their books. We've authored, we helped authors with 17 books published today. The reason we're a resource department of defense, EPA, POW recovery. And that's really interesting when you find out, that, when you hear somebody say, hey, they just recovered another one. Because there's the Greg's territory is the Pacific Ocean, if you can believe that. He's never home. <laughs> We've been on the History Channel looking for Yamashita's gold. They call us on Thursdays. We'll be on Saturday looking for Yamashita's gold. Uh, can you wait till we get it all organized here or something? No, I've got to come up now. Okay. And we were partnering with, with uh, museums in Japan, California, Virginia. We did, a, we did an archive in California for a, a Memorial Day event. We did one in Virginia, Ohio, the Philippines. And we're a training site for five colleges for uni and universities for archive work and digital archiving. We have a digital archiving lab. And we work with some folks down at the West Virginia Managed Council, which we're very proud to help be a partner with them, and also with WBU and their, and their, their project, the cemetery project. And uh, we're very happy to be part of that. And uh, so uh, thanks to those guys. We have a new project coming up called Project 247. We know, because we have a list, there's 247 POWs that were from West Virginia. And we'd like to honor them somehow. Right now, there's only 50 total POWs, uh, after all, of about 40,000 men and women that went over there. There's only 50 left. The 247 from West Virginia, we know they're all gone. So we're looking for their relatives so we can honor them next year in our big project for the end of World War II. Uh, we're going to simulcast that with, in, to Japan, and uh, it's going to be a big event out there for us, so I hope you all can come up with it. So we're trying to find out the descendants of these POWs, and that's, that's where we're going. Let's we forget. Eddie Jackford said, I hope we never forget. And we hope we put this museum together so nobody will ever forget tragedies and atrocities were suffered by these men and women during World War II. There we go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brockman, for that great presentation. I saw a couple of our archivists' eyes light up when you mentioned your archives and your digital stuff, so I'm sure they'll want to chat at lunch.